Eckhart Tolle and Wayne Dyer together. I first became aware of your teachings when I was living in London and a friend of mine gave me a book. She worked in a bookstore, the famous Watkins bookstore in London, the oldest metaphysical bookstore in the world, and she gave me a novel, and the author was Wayne Dyer. It was in the 80s, and it was a novel about a woman from outer space who came to the planet to give spiritual teachings. Right. Her name was Icus. Uh, it was actually, my daughter was born that year, and uh, it was her name spelled backwards. Sky, E Y K I S, and um, it was about someone who visited an, an, another world where um, it was exact duplicate of Earth, uh, except that um, the people there um, were neurotic, like we are here. Except they were neurotic there because there was a reason to be. Um, when this visitor first checked into the hotel. He turned on the television set and someone gave the news <clears throat> and then they gave the weather and they gave the sports and then they gave the anxiety attack report. The likelihood of anxiety attacking over the weekend it was coming in high, it was coming in fast over the mountains. You want to get out your Xanax and your no pain and uh, your tranquilizers because it's going to be heavy doses of anxiety because here on Uranus, which is the title of the, the place that they went, um, anxiety really attacks. And uh, Icus comes to Earth and she's looking at all these people saying um, they're having anxiety attacks, but there's no anxiety and it doesn't attack. The original title of that book uh, was going to be called If You Want to Be Happy, Get Your Head Out of Uranus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out to be a little bit more serious, um, and we're actually made, made a we're making a movie of that of that. Oh of yeah, that book. Oh, it's I the only fiction see. thing I've ever undertaken. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it reminds me a little bit of an uh, Aldous Huxley wrote a novel mm -hmm. called Island, which is about a fictitious island. Somebody gets shipwrecked on this island, where he begins to realize the natives live consciously and in awareness. And even the, the parrots in the trees have been trained to remind people to be conscious. So they, they say things like, attention, attention, <laughs> meaning be present. Mm -hmm be there, one could say, be there as the, the witnessing presence of your mind. So if you haven't read it yet, you might enjoy that. And mm -hmm. is your book still available? It is. No? It's yeah. uh, still in print. Everything I've done is still in print. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> yes, it's called Gifts from Icus. Yeah. 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 But it, what you're saying reminds me of, uh, do you know who Mary Oliver is? He's a, a well-known poet. Um, she wrote a poem I used to recite in my talks called uh, Wild Geese. And she was asked, um, what were the, what's the secret to living an enlightened life? And she said, it just boils down to, and it reminds me of what you just said, pay attention, <clears throat> be astonished, and tell other people. She said, that's all you need for a successful life. And uh, I think about p paying attention. Is the key. It is. It's a big part of what you do, I know. Yes. Mm. And that's, of course, the, I've told that story quite a few times in the past, but not for a few years, so maybe I can say it. It's a Zen, a Zen about a Zen teacher who actually lived, I don't know when, 100 years ago, in Japan, 
and his only teaching whenever he was asked to explain the meaning of Zen, his only answer would be to raise his index finger and look at you. That's the meaning of Zen. What it points to, of course, is the state of presence, the alert presence. That's just the whole teaching. Of course, Zen is many people who are drawn to Zen try to understand it conceptually and they just don't get it. Yeah. I know there are Zen monks who just don't get it mm. because there's nothing to understand conceptually. It's entering the state of consciousness of presence. Mm. So it's frustrating. So Zen develop methods to frustrate the mind even more so that it finally gives up its attempt to understand or mm. to know conceptually. Right. And that's really, it's not, that is not just Zen, that is really the essence, even Course in Miracles says, your understanding is not a powerful contribution to the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And the paradox is that out of that state of presence, very often if there's really something you need to know, it arises. As right. Yeah, someone sent me a t-shirt that I, I, I gave to my son. It says, uh, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a Zen master. Yeah. <laughs> and that brings us to an interesting uh, topic, and that is being and doing. Mm. To, to be in the, to reconcile within oneself the two dimensions, because here as human beings we are called upon to take action and to alt create, as the universe loves to create f new forms, billions, trillions of life forms. We are part of this love of the universe to create form. And then, and I know that because I have observed myself and you know it because you know yourself, the universe also wants to know its own essence through you, the source. It wants the conscious realization of the source. Mm -hmm. And in human beings, that's expressed as the, the draw towards, the con to be totally content with what is, the, to be totally at peace in the present moment, to, to long for that state of, of absolute beautiful, deep peace. Mm. And I call that, uh, in a minute, I'd like your input. I call that the, 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 it's the outgoing movement of the universe is wanting to create. And the return movement of the universe is wanting to know itself and it, through the human as in its essence. So the universe wants, they said two, so perhaps everybody here can also feel that within. On, yes, you want to do things, but you also want to be. So to, not to lose being while you do, and not lose yourself in the doing, get stressed, the f getting, the fruit of the action, Bhagavad Gita, not to, not to always look to the, the next thing to attain so that to remain rooted in being and then act from there, from that rootedness, not out of egoic need to have, but out of the inner fullness. And I'm sure that you have a lot to contribute here I, too. <clears throat> I think of uh, Moby Dick, one of my favorite novels, and the author speaks of, uh, in these words, this great writing always intrigues me, and I memorized it when I was in high school. <laughs> he said, for as, as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life.
the half-lived life. And when you speak about being and doing, I think one of the major problems, Eckhart, for, uh, for our world and for us is that um, we really aren't raised um, to believe in our extraordinariness, uh, about how extraordinarily, how divine we are, how, uh, that we're all not just pieces of God, but that we are all God, we are all part of God. We, and that's something we carry around with us. And this ordinary part of us, the part of us that is, you know, called the ego, you know, the, the part of us that believes that who we are is what we accumulate and what we accomplish and what other people think of us and, and the part of us that is separate from everyone else and the part of us that feels like we have to own things and so on. And that we were born into this world of, uh, where the, there's nothing to do. You know, there's like the, when a baby's inside a mother's womb, there's not, there's, what, what does she have to do? What does the baby have to do? It's a, in the Tao, the Tao says, um, the Tao does nothing, and it leaves nothing undone. It's become my son's favorite mantra, because I say, Sense, come on, do something, let's go. And he'll say, I do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I leave nothing undone. <laughs> so, um, but this, this part of us, so we're, we're sort of snatched out of that perfection and, and, and programmed into a, a life of uh, accumulating and achieving and what we start to believe that this is who we are. And we never get to the part of us that is extraordinary because the, the ordinary part of us feels that we're having a successful life if we go through the motions, if we go through school, if we get good grades, if uh, we get into the right school, if we meet the right person, if we fill out the forms, if we pay our taxes, if we don't get arrested, if we follow the rules, you know, this is like sort of, this is an ordinary life. And um, I speak to an extraordinary life and, as, uh, and I have so much respect for the work that you have done over the years. Um, but our, the, the extraordinary part of us um, still has ordinary in it. I mean, you, st you know, we still have to, we still have to follow the rules, most of them, and we still have to fill out the forms and, you know, I'm sure you pay your taxes, right? And, uh, you know, we, and so you can be an extraordinary being, but you still have ordinariness in it. But beyond ordinary is this, um, is what we call the soul, because we just don't know, have another name for it, you know? And in the Tao Te Ching, the opening lines of the Tao say, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. So you're stuck already, you can't even call it anything because it goes into two-ness. Now it is what it is and the name that you call it. But the extraordinary part of, us, of who we all are is the soul. It's that invisibleness that doesn't, that's formless, that has no boundaries, it has no beginnings, it's birthless, it's changeless, it's deathless. And this part of us, doesn't care about winning, it doesn't care about owning, it doesn't care about happiness, it doesn't care about being better than anyone else. It just, it just wants to expand. It wants to grow. It's, it's miserable. The soul is miserable when you contain it, when you put a fence around it, when you put a label on it, when you tell it what it can be and what it can't be. All of us have this extraordinariness called the soul, which is infinite. Because if it, it, if it wasn't infinite, it would be finite. And if it was finite, you'd be able to find the end of it or the beginning of it. So because it's not finite, it's infinite. This means that it, um, what does infinity mean? It's just always expanding. It's just, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. This is the part that we need to address, I think, within ourselves is this infinite part of us that doesn't need to fit in, doesn't need to be right, doesn't need to be better than anybody else. It just wants to expand and grow and not be told, this is what you can do, this is what, this is what your limits are, this is what's not possible for you. And I have always, I don't know about you, but always my entire life have been, and have just been intrigued by extraordinary people, by extraordinary events, by people who can do things. As soon as I as soon as I see someone can levitate, I was like, I want to know all about that. You know, how do you go about doing someone who can, you know, Carolyn Mace talks about defying gra gravity. Or, in the, you know, Joel Goldsmith says that in the presence of the God realized, uh, the laws of the, of the physical world do not apply. You know, can, can you make electronic equipment stop with your consciousness and so on? And, 
those kinds of things, those extraordinary accomplishments. I just read a book that just blew me away. I don't know if you've read this, called Unbroken by uh, Laura Hillerbrand. Have any of you read that, Unbroken? It's one of, the great, one of the great reads you'll ever read in your life. And it's, it's a story of a man who survived impossible things. And he's now 94 years old. And he was shot down during World War II. And he, he cruised on a raft across the Pacific Ocean. Every word of it is true. But the, 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 the extraordinariness of this, of this being and what he accomplished and how he survived, those things I, think, I, I just think that we need to address ourselves, people like us who have a big audience, to creating a world of extraordinary people who look beyond what they were programmed to become, ordinary, filling out the forms and so on, to those to where we can expand and really change the world. This kind of thing can really, truly impact the entire consciousness of this planet. I really think it can happen. Yes. Yeah. And the basis for that, so in a way, we are talking about creating, mm. and the, you, earlier you mentioned that part w within everyone, the essence that is timeless and infinite, and that's the being. And so conscious union with that can then lead to awakened as I call it, awakened doing. Mm. So if we go back for a moment to the being part, as Wayne was speaking and as I am speaking, pointing towards that dimension within you, the question is whether at this very moment, so that it's not a it's not another belief in your mind. I mean, it's comforting to believe I am an infinite being, but that's a belief. And then is there, can you sense the reality of that? Mm -hmm. And as we sit here, can we sense the reality of that within ourselves where you are no longer deriving your sense of identity or your sense of who you are from ideas in your head. That's the start. Because from in the normal consciousness, which is unconsciousness, who you feel you are, which of course is the limited self, the conditioned self, the time-bound self, what, what the Buddha called the self, the mm -hmm. delusion, what Jesus pointed to when he said, deny thyself as the, one of the essential points of his teaching, deny thyself, been misinterpreted by the churches as if you had to say, oh miserable me, mm -hmm. that's not it at all. Deny thyself is recognize the unreality of that self, of that, of that basing your sense of who you are on what ideas you hold in your head, thoughts in other words, that tell you mm -hmm. about your story, about who you are. And, and getting, never feeling really fulfilled, it's always not quite sufficient, so mm -hmm. you need to defend this mental edifice of who you are and so on. You need to add to it. I need, maybe then I'll be fully myself when I achieve mm -hmm. that. So at this moment, can you sense that within you there is an unconditioned, timeless consciousness which has nothing to do with thinking, which is prior to all thinking, which is, you cannot make it into an object and say, ah, there it is, mm -hmm. because it's the eternal subject, it's the I, the one I, it's, it's spacious presence, I'm just using different pointers because different pointers work for different people, it's spacious presence, it's a sense of deep aliveness that has nothing to do with your history whatsoever mm. and nothing to do with your future whatsoever. So if you can touch that within you, that is the liberation mm. from the false sense of self. And it's, once you can sense that, it's actually 
it's exhilarating to feel that which transcends the limited self in you, mm. that presence that cannot be conceptualized, that cannot be named, right. the Tao. That's the, that's the, so this is why we're here, to experience exactly. that. Uh, the, the great saint in India uh, named Muktananda um, was asked the question, what is real? And he said, um, that is real, which never changes, period. So now you try to define yourself using that definition. Like the question Eckhart is addressing here is, who am I? And the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm this body, you know. But um, how many bodies have you been in since you incarnated just this time? How many bodies have you shown up in? You were in one this big, you were in a little toddler body, you were in one that stands like this, like all my teenage daughters do, and roll their eyes. <laughs> I was in a 20-year-old body, and um, I just saw a picture of it. I just did a new public television special, and I saw that picture floating across. And, and when I was in that body, when I was in that body, uh, I really believed it was real. But it's been 50 years, and I can't find it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know where it is. Like there's, no, there's nothing in this body. There's not one cell left over in this body that was in that body. And that's true for every single person watching and every si single person in this room. So that um, who you are is the, that which keeps occupying new bodies on a regular basis. In fact, if Deepak were up here with us, he would say that the body you came into watch this uh, presentation with will be very different than the one that you will leave here with. <laughs> now, we can't see the changes going on in that place, but we're in a world. So if everything that is changing isn't real, who we really are, there's a, there's a higher self within each and every one of us, or a highest self. And a higher self, to me, is, is like, it's like I, one of my teachings was that, uh, that the Creator takes, puts a spark of Himself into each and every creation. So there's a spark of God in each and every one of us. But my experience, especially lately in, in my own life, has been that um, that spark can grow from a spark to a fragment to a segment to, a, to something bigger. It can get as big as a soccer ball. It can get bigger and bigger inside of you until you ultimately reach another conclusion, that, uh, the same conclusion that Jesus came to when he was about to be stoned uh, because he blasphemed. They, he said, why would you stone me? And, uh, they said to him that uh, we stone you because uh, you are a man and you claim to be God. And he said, is it not written in your laws that I have said, you are gods, you are gods. This comes right out of the, the mouth of Jesus. And St. Paul, writing in Philippians, in his letters to the Philippians, says, uh, have in you the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But we've taken this idea of, of, of this, this place that you're speaking of, this, this perfect infinite presence, this place of divine peace, and um, interpreted the words, I am God, or you are God, to be the God that we've created in our own images. This God who's angry and this God who has the power to heal, but um, uh, restricts it to some and gives it to others, this God that demands payment and fancy, you know, buildings and gold embroidered uh, costumes and, and so on, and, uh, and created a God like that. When in fact, again, out of the scriptures, Jesus said, when asked, who is God? He said, uh, God is love. I mean, I don't know, is there a better word for it than that? Yes. And of course, the impermanence and the changing body or inhabiting different bodies. The same applies to the psychological, because the body is the physical form, and then that's the start, starting point for most people's sense of identity. That's, I am this external appearance, and so on. The next place that people use 
to define their identity through, of course, is the psychological self-image, mm -hmm. which is also changing, which consists of the stream of thinking accompanied by certain emotions that continuously happen, that also changes in, from year to year, who you consider yourself to be, the psychological self. So we have the double delusion, delusory identifications. One is with the physical vehicle, and then there is the identification with the mental, emotional vehicle also, which is not who you are, which also is part of the continuous flux of forms. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that is already, you're, when you recognize that, it's a kind of relief in a way. If you, if you really consider the fact of the impermanence of the physical form and the impermanence of the psychological form, you say, wow, it's to the, to the ego, which really ego is the identification with that, that gives you a sense of self, that's the ego. So to the ego, that's bad news. Mm -hmm. It says, oh, that's terrible. Everything is impermanent. I don't want to hear that, it says mm -hmm. the ego. That's dreadful. It's depressing. Don't talk to me about death. Depressing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's something else in you that actually feels actually alive suddenly and exhilarated when you he hear the fact of impermanence. This, and suddenly something awakens in you that is not part of the impermanence, mm -hmm. that which does not change. And that we could call it this or that, but it's never quite right. We c I sometimes call it con pure consciousness, the unconditioned consciousness, the formless consciousness, Thought is consciousness having been born into a form. The physical body is consciousness having been born into a temporary physical vehicle. So consciousness assumes form continuously, and that's the deeper meaning of reincarnation. One could say, every time I get caught up in a thought that arises in my head, and by caught up I mean identified with the thought. The thought has me in its power. Every time that happens, I reincarnate into form, into the thought form. So you reincarnate into physical bodies, but you also reincarnate into the mind continuously because you identify with the mind. So to stop the cycle of reincarnation, which is what the Buddhists are trying to do, mm -hmm. but they have a kind of traditional idea of it, but the, the, the more immediate thing you can do is to n don't believe in every thought that arises in your head. So it doesn't, you don't get caught up in every thought that arises. And you, be, you realize there is a dimension in you that is an aware presence from where you can look at a thought and see it come and go. And you can see it's, oh, that's, it's negative. It has a certain vibrational quality to it, which may be high or low. Mm. And so you can you, you touch the place where you are not the physical body, where you are not the thoughts and emotions, although these are there, where you are that spacious presence, the awareness for that. That's the eternal, that's the eternal I. Mm. And that's the light of the world. That's Jesus again, you quoted it Jesus. Jesus said two things. He said, I am the light of the world. And then somewhere else he said, you are the light of the world. Mm. Both. Right. That word I am is very big <laughs> in my consciousness and in my awareness. I've just written a whole book that will be out in the spring on this whole idea of I am. It's, um, it's the only place in all the scriptures in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, um, in Exodus, you know, there's Moses out there floating uh, on, a, uh, <laughs> on a basket in the Nile, and he gets picked up and, um, by the Pharaoh's daughter and uh, is raised as uh, the, the grandson of the Pharaoh who had ordered all male children to be drowned and so on, and uh, then he escapes after committing a murder when he was 17 or 18 years old and defending uh, someone from uh, 
that was being persecuted, one of the Isra Israelites, moves out to the Sinai and uh, is out walking one day 40 years later after he married and children and he's a shepherd and all of a sudden he encounters uh, a, a burning bush and this is a bush that um, doesn't doesn't get consumed it just keeps burning and a voice comes from the from the burning bush and says to uh, Moses it calls out name Moses Moses now this is 1300 years before the birth of Christ that's 13 centuries that's 800 years before Lao Tzu uh, so this is a uh, one of our most ancient texts and stories, and it's the only place where God's name is given. And uh, God is, yells out Moses, and the first words that Moses says to God are, here I am. And then he starts telling Moses this wet, weird story. You're going to go out and you're going to free all of your people. I'm going to send you to the promised land. You're going to free them all. And, and he said, who am I? Who am I to do this? He said, well, I will be with you, it says in Exodus. And finally, um, but he said, Who, what is your name? He said, what, shall I, what am I going to say to these people? And he said, my name is, I am that I am. And that shall be my name for all future generations. That is my name. So the name I am is really the name of God. And you have to ask yourself the question every time you use it, you know, in the book of Joel, it says, let the weak say, I am strong. How do you declare your I am's? Because most of your I am's are associated with your ordinariness, <laughs> with your physical world, with uh, your mind that you're speaking about. But when you begin to say, you know, I am well, which I say to myself, and I've had a diagnosis that tells me I'm not supposed to be able to say that, but... Uh, I know the greatest gift I've ever been given is the gift of my imagination, the gift of um, being able to place anything in there and put a do not disturb sign around it and, and super glue my intentions to that inner, inner place. And just, and you, you mentioned the words Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. He also said, I am the resurrection. He didn't say, I am the crucifixion. <laughs> And we've placed so much emphasis on that in the world, on the suffering, and not enough, I think, on this being who has transcended and, and, and is that being of light. But I ask every one of you watching, every one of you in here, to be very careful when you use the words I am, because you say I am weak. And when, when Moses said, what is your name, he didn't, God didn't say, um, my name is I hope things work out, <laughs> you know, or my name is I will be. <laughs> because to say I will be means I am not. He said, I am that I am, meaning everything that exists, I am that I am, which means you. And you can use the name I am. And one of the things, Eckhart, uh, you and I talked about in preparation for doing this is not only to look at it from sort of a f academic, philosophical point of view, but, but how can we apply what our teachings really bring to the world because um, this world we're in right now I mean this it, it's it needs what we're speaking about here in a big way it needs an I am God in the sense of I am love uh, as what we walk around with in our peace and in our quiet because this is the first time in the history of this country that a child born today's life expectancy is less than its parents it's never happened before uh, and its expectancy for earning what it can earn is seriously diminished from what, um, what its parents were. And we have, um, you know, we have a nation of addicts. I mean, not just to illegal drugs and so on, but to just prescriptions. You know, people, I mean, in the year, this is, this is a shock you, in the year 1970, there were two billion prescription tablets prescribed in America. Two billion individual tablets, 1970. In 2007, one generation later, that number is 113 billion. In one generation. I mean, who doesn't have four or five or six prescription drugs that they're taking? And I mean, my daughter just lost her best friend's fiance to an overdose of, of, of uh, these prescription drugs, these painkillers that, that people are taking. Antipsychotic drugs, I mean, we're loaded with them. 
Not only that, but I mean, our, our food supply has been contaminated. I mean, it's like people are, t we have 31% of young people obese. What, the, what is going on? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a lack of consciousness. You know, the, you know, genetically modified organisms put into our foods, you know, and violence. Last year in the city of Chicago, 242 students were shot to death in one city? In one school system, you know, it's like you know, just a few days ago in Nevada, somebody walked in with a Uzi or an AK-47 and blew away seven or eight people in Carson City. I want the people who are, you know, who are voting to end the sale of these massive weapons that are so capable of killing people to stand up and be counted. I mean, violence, contamination, addictions. We get enough people thinking w that I am God and I am love and projecting it. I mean, one of the things I got from, from watching what you did with Oprah is the awareness that um, when we reach elevated levels of consciousness that you're speaking about, when we are totally here, now, present, that we don't just affect ourselves but we affect, we literally affect those around us, right? I mean, is that, yes. is that what you're teaching? I mean, yes. That was very impactful to me that it's important for me to pay attention and to be astonished because, not just because I'll feel better and I'll have a, a nice conversation like this, but because the next person that I encounter will be impacted by that. And the next, and enough of us, the number of people in here, the number of people watching, I mean, I think it's what we're called to do, Eckhart. I think that's why we have a voice. I really do. It's on the people you come into contact with, the, your state of consciousness or your state of unconsciousness also gets, transmits itself. So one negative person can create a chain reaction of negativity in many others. And in the same way, a conscious person can dissolve streams of negativity. The buck stops here. You, you, if, you're, if you're conscious and non-reactive, the stream stops. It dissolves in the presence mm. that you are. And so not only do you affect those you come into contact with, you affect the collective, the underlying collective field of human consciousness. So. I feel sure that you affect countless others you never even meet because all human consciousness is connected. The consciousness of every individual human at a deeper level is part of the collective consciousness of humanity. And it's, just, it's beyond people too though, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I, I was with Christian Northrup, do you know Dr. Northrup? Um, just in Pasadena, we were giving a talk together and, and she was so excited just before she was going on to speak. She said, I just saw this incredible piece of research. She said that when you have a garden and you plant vegetables in the garden for you to eat, that whatever it is that you need in terms of what is missing in your life, whether it's a vitamin deficiency or whether it's your immune system deficiency or if you've got cancer or whatever, it is, those plants that are nurtured by you will provide just for you what you need when you eat them, not for the person next door. It's, I mean, that's an amazing piece of research. That, uh, so it isn't just human consciousness, I think. It's like there's a symbiotic kind of thing. And it's like, there's some people, like when you walk into a room, you just know. I mean, I walked into a room once with Mother Teresa many years ago, and it's like everything changed. The, the room was in a, in a different state. Um, Patanjali had these wonderful words. He said, when you're steadfast, that means you never slip. When you're steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed towards yourself and others, that all living creatures will cease to feel fear in your presence. I mean, we can impact the whole, the whole sphere, the whole universe, I think, can be impacted if we just begin to recognize that we are God. We are God. It's such, a T.S. Eliot had that wonderful note. He said, we shall not cease from exploration, but at the end of all of our exploring will be 
to return to the place from which we originated and to know it for the first time. Yes. I don't think you have to die no. for that. I think he was speaking about death, but I don't think we are. Or certainly I'm not, and I don't think you are either. No, that's also the same truth is in the parable uh, in that Jesus tells of what's you traditionally called the prodigal son, mm. which actually is a very ancient uh, parable in different traditions it's used. Uh, you all probably know it. The son is the son of a rich father, and he goes out. He says to the father, give me your inheritance, and he travels to some distant land and squanders his inheritance. He becomes a beggar. In other versions of it, he even forgets who he is. He, does, he forgets that he is the son of that father. So he sits there by the roadside begging, and then the father sends messengers to him, to, sends out messengers to the distant country, and they find the son, and they say, do you know who you are? And, he says, no. and, and then he begins to remember, and then he returns to the father's house, and that's, I, that's the, what I mentioned earlier, the return movement, and then for the, when he returns, it says the father loves him more deeply than before. Mm -hmm. And to me that means, this is the story of humanity. Humanity losing itself in the in externals, losing connectedness with the source of all being, with the one. Not absolutely losing it, but total unawareness of it. And so we become beggars, and this is the condition of most humans who are not yet going through the spiritual awakening, which in other words is not, not really your condition anymore, but it's still the majority of people on the planet who are, who, who have not, who, who are not connected consciously with the source within themselves. So they are looking for scraps for fulfillment, and scraps is anything, uh, from the house to the car to this or that, give me a new partner, this, some, anything to, to give me fulfillment, to tell me who I am. So they're seeking it there and there. That's the condition of the, the person who has lost awareness of the source. And then the, perhaps what the meaning of the messengers is in the parable is, perhaps a spiritual teacher or a spiritual teaching that somehow you come into contact with, or the messenger could be, as I see it, could also be just the suffering becomes so much that the, the pressure of it awakens you, and, the, and then you begin to realize who you are, and you return then, that means you suddenly become aware again of that deep connectedness with being, your essential oneness with being. And the meaning of what the parable says that is loved more deeply by the Father, I interpret that as meaning that when you regain awareness of being, which perhaps humans had a long, long time ago in the distant past, and that could be the reason for the, all the myths in many, many cultures of the golden age. Right. In many cultures on the planet, you have different versions of the myth of there was once a golden age when people lived in happiness, and, and mm -hmm. that, that perhaps points to the, our original connectedness with source, then we lost it, this was our up to, up to very recently, and now returning to the home, the father's home, means to regain that awareness, but at a deeper level, because whereas before it was in your natural state, you, you may know from your own life when you have lost something, and then you come back to it, you appreciate it much more deeply. This applies, for example, to our awareness of nature. In the past, we lived in natural connectedness with nature and respecting nature. It was so natural, we didn't know we lived in natural connectedness with nature because nature was all there was. Then we lost it, we created a, a world that is almost um, 
hostile towards nature. It's one of the absurdities or dysfunctions of our condition. Right. And now there is an, an enormous awareness in many humans towards the sacredness of the natural world. We really know it. We know it more deeply now than, we, than before. Mm. So also when we go to the source, return to the awareness of that, there is an added dimension there that wasn't there when we lived thousands and thousands of years ago in natural connectedness. Now there is a conscious connectedness with source and that's the, new, the next level in human evolution. I think it is, I, and, and I, think, I don't think it's an accident that um, people like yourself and myself um, uh, have an audience for that, that return to source. You know, I mean, I just did a public television special, uh, public television, um, and it's basically, the theme of it is, it's called Wishes Fulfilled, but the theme of it is that you are, that God is in every single one of us, and that they approved it really surprised me, but uh, because they're always so careful about separating out and not, you can't say you are God and you know, you, you, that uh, you are divine and all of that because somebody might get upset about it and they just, it just seems to be a new way. But I'm thinking, Eckhart, as you were speaking, when you're talking about the prodigal son, that it's really, I don't know if it's your story, but it is mine. And I have gotten lost on several occasions in my life. Um, I spent a lot of years in an orphanage, I spent uh, years struggling through addictions, I've spent years um, dealing with um, uh, separation and divorce and the pain of that, and now um, leukemia. Um, and each one of these has been um, almost um, a way for uh, me to uh, to recognize that all spiritual advances are, are preceded by a fall of some kind or another. My, my friend Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, passed away a few years ago, used to say that if you shield the mountain from the windstorms, you'll never see the beauty of the carvings. And the storms of our life, and the storms of my life, and particularly this recent one, we had talked about this earlier, about this leukemia, um, has brought me to just, um, it's brought me back to, to, you're calling it source, I'm calling it God. Um, it doesn't matter, we could call it Irene, it doesn't make any difference what we call it because the Tao that can be named is not the Tao anyway. <laughs> um, but what came into my life at this time in the last couple of years with this are just very significant people who have showed up in my life uh, uh, healing experience that I had with John of God down in uh, Brazil that um, was done uh, remotely from Brazil to Maui uh, and I was told, I mean I had someone come here to Maui, a, a physician, uh, her name was Dr. Reina Piscova, um, she's an eye surgeon in California, she wanted me to go down there because she'd heard I'd had leukemia, I couldn't go or I didn't go and um, she made all kinds of extra special arrangements for me to have uh, photos taken and all dressed in white, drinking certain kind of uh, liquids and, and having um, herbs that I was taking. And, you know, I had a healthy, a healthy level of skepticism around, you know, this kind of thing, as I'm sure many of you do as well. But I, I urge you to, um, like Talopa said, have a mind that's open to everything and attached to nothing. Like, just open your mind up to this because from here, that the night, it was the 21st of April this year, my mother's 95th birthday. And uh, I had surgery at 7 o'clock in the morning from Brazil to Maui. I don't know how this gets done. I, uh, uh, and then a week later, I had to, I stayed in bed for a whole week. I could hardly even walk. I was so just. I just, the day after the surgery, I got up and they, Raina had called me, she said, now you've had surgery. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, you can't swim and you can't do yoga and you can't walk and you can't do these kind of things. And I said, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> and I got a hundred yards from my place and I collapsed and had to be helped back and I was in bed for a week. 
And when they remove the sutures, which are invisible sutures, which don't exist even, um, uh, from that moment on, Eckhart, something happened to me that was so... Uh, it just... When Mary Oliver said, be astonished, and, and Rumi said, sell your cleverness and, and purchase bewilderment, I've been in a state of bewilderment since that time. Uh, I had my 71st birthday just a few weeks after that, and uh, all I wanted to do was uh, give things away. I was filming in, in San Francisco at the St. Francis Hotel, and I took a wad of $50 bills and $100 bills and just to all the homeless people that I could find. I would talk to them. And, it was the most, and I was sobbing through this whole thing. It was like I became a basket case <laughs> of love. And it's been half a year or more, and everyone I encounter and everything I see, everything just looks different. Uh, and it was, it's like a return to, uh, to an awareness that, um, I mean, I am well. I am perfect health. I don't go to doctors now. I don't have my numbers checked. I, I, I gave up yoga for, for a year after they told me I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do hot yoga. And I, I believed them and my body started getting tired and I couldn't do it. And then one morning I was just told, uh, you can go do yoga. You don't have to avoid any of that. You're, you're perfectly well. And then I met John of God in September up at uh, Omega where we first met. Um, just a few months ago, and I spent, and I, I walked amongst, there was 1,500 people a day walking past him, and I was just put in there. He had no idea who I was from anybody else. They didn't tell me, tell them how special I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> neglected to tell that. And, uh, and he looked at me, and he just smiled, and in Portuguese, he just said, you are well. He said, please sit here and observe my interventions for the next three days, which is what I did. And it's just been, it's just been, it's just been love, I heard. It's just been love, love, love. I mean, it's almost like God entered, somehow they put a God consciousness in me that I thought I had because I'd been writing about it. Um, and the old ego, I mean, it's always, it's, it's always there. I don't know if you know this, I don't even know if I'm going to mention this, but I'm going to do it, obviously. <laughs> You know, there's a list out on the, uh, uh, on the internet of the 100 most spiritually influential people alive. Have you seen this list? Yeah. Yeah, you have. Yeah. <laughs> you and I are going to have to have a talk here. So they have the 100 from the top to the bottom. And this is where the ego and the spirit are just so, it's just such an interesting thing. <laughs> because you're listening right now to the third most spiritually influential person alive. That's me. <laughs> and that's my ego. Isn't that great? Thank you. And there's two people ahead of me on this list. Now my spirit says, you're not any better than anybody else. You're just connected to God like everyone else. This is, why would you even think that? And then the ego just is tapping me on the shoulder and said, uh, I know you can take those two guys ahead of you down. <laughs> So, so the number two spiritually influential person alive, according to Watkins, this list, is um, the Dalai Lama. And the number one spiritually influential, I can't even say it, spiritually influential person alive is Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> so now I don't know whether we should get together and go after the Dalai Lama and then... Maybe we can arm wrestle. <laughs> but it's that funny thing, it's all the time, because I use it on my kids all the time, you know. <laughs> I even said to my ex-wife, you know, can, in your wildest dreams, could you ever imagine that you were married to the third most spiritually influential person in the world? She said, they didn't call me. <laughs> and she said, I don't know how to break it to you, but you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> But I think that's interesting that, that you, and I just found out about that list, the day I found out about that list, I got a call from Eckhart Tolle saying, would you like to, we're going to come to Maui, we'd like to do a conference together, and I thought, this is my chance, I'm going. <laughs> I love you, man. I love you. <laughs> this is, um, 
Yeah. <laughs> the concepts like that, that come floating into your mind, uh, I saw it also, somebody sent me this right. list. Um, these concepts have to be, when they come in, they have to be dropped like hot potatoes. <laughs> Because if you hang on to it, it, it that moment, this, this, the spirit gets obscured. If you think you are somebody who is somebody, immediately that would be the denial of the reality of it. So the, the art really is the, and it's tricky because I've, had, I've seen it happen to other spiritual teachers, some, and some have, were able to drop the hot potato when pe people came with beliefs and projections about them. And I've seen others who, who took it on board and became burdened by mm. some self-concept that others were projecting onto them. This is particularly uh, more likely to happen if you live in an ashram and you're surrounded only by people who think you are the greatest, mm -hmm. then it's, it's very easy to slip into that and start to believe in some concept of who you are, right. which immediately obscures the power of spirit. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, I'm sure you know who uh, Rabindranath Tagore, the great uh, an Indian poet who won the, the Nobel Prize back in the 1920s. He talked about the ego. He had this great observation poetically. He said, um, I went out alone on my way to my tryst, but who is this me in the dark? I step aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. <laughs> he adds his loud voice to every word I utter. <laughs> he is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame. But I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that's, Beautiful. That's Tagore, that's the ego, yeah. That's for Tagore. <laughs> and the, uh, int I mentioned briefly yesterday when with Ram Das, um, just, I'm sure you can recognize it in your, perhaps in your own experience, but it might be helpful for some of you. When I, let's say, just take a moment of coming here in the car from where we are staying to here to have this dialogue. Um, you can, at any moment, you can be either more a form identity, in which case you, you, your mind functions through your history, who your concepts of who you are that others have told you and you believe and you have created that mental self. And at any moment you can be either more, dwell more in this form identity of who you are, my name, my history, my achievements or my failures, they're all form identity, or you can be an essence identity, which is simply an, an aware presence, where you don't need to remember anything or think anything, just be that field of awareness. So the only way I can ever go to a, a talk, an important gathering, if I travel as spiritual teacher number one, going to meet spiritual teacher number three, <laughs> It would, be, it would create immediate stress mm. because I would be carrying that a, ment a conceptual self, a dreadful burden, but if I can be free of a conceptual self and be simply a presence, a, an, just an innocent, aware presence, and as I say it now, perhaps each one of you can at this very moment find that within you you can be either a person or you can be an aware presence. And then, at this moment, and the aware presence is alive, beauty is not bigger than, smaller than, more important than, but it's powerful, but not more powerful than its power itself. And there's no 
unease in it because it's not, it, it competes with nothing. Mm. And so, uh, so the, sometimes when I give, let's say I give a, a talk or there's a gathering or retreat, I'm a hundred percent kind of presence. The, the person isn't really there. Mm. The, and then in everyday life, perhaps it's hard to quantify, but mm. I might be a uh, 30% person, 70% consciousness. It's a coming together of form and formlessness in but daily life. Do you life. find when you're in that higher place where you're like 100% often in a meditation or whatever, yeah. but if, if you, if you, even if you leave the meditation and you just, like I was talking to you, what happened with that surgery and so on and with this, my body just changing and everything I look at and every one that I look at is just so, I'm just so astonished and so bewildered and, and basically just feeling so, so loved. Do you find, personally Eckhart, that, um, that your opportunity to serve literally strangers, whatever, I mean people, you, you almost like see opportunities to, to be God, to, you know, I mean, how do you define, I mean, I always use the poets because I do a lot of poetry, my Zahafi said, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. <laughs> Just think what a love like that can do, it lights up the whole world. And I have found that people who are needing something that I have to give them keep showing up and it's such a joy to give away, to serve, whether it's, yes. whether it's advice, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's clothes, whatever it might be. I yes. mean, does, that, does that happen for you? Yes, all the time. Like, yeah. that's, uh, I can see, by the way, in your eyes, we met for the first time, was it ten years ago, at Omega, right. very briefly, and you were a lovely being then, but now I can see what I, perhaps the, the, t the physical challenge that you are facing mm -hmm. perhaps did that, it eroded your ego and there's in your eyes there's a um, wonderful, this love mm -hmm. the, um, and tenderness and I believe the, the, the grace that came through the illness the, right. that came into your life through mm -hmm. that. I can't tell you how many sick people that I've been able to help that have just sort of shown up for me and when I just did this television special which will air all over, you know, all over the world for years and years and um, it's, 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 um, it feels like such a, even just to be here and to see these faces and to know that out there that um, people are going to be touched by, I mean, we got a world full of cancer, you know, we got a world, full, and, and it's almost all from fear. I mean, we just, and the Course says always, you know, there's only fear and love, and everything that is fear cannot be love, and everything that is love cannot be fear. So you get your choice, you know, and yes. it seems to me we're, we're talking about sending fear out of our lives and judgment, yes. and, you know, in the I Am Discourses it says that the, if you can remove if you can remove judgment, criticism, and condemnation towards any of God's children, I believe that means the planet as well, then that's when you will be able to manifest for yourself the life that you, that you desire. As judgment. soon as you can rid yourself of those three things, judgment, criticism, judgment, criticism condemnation. condemnation. Yeah. Yes, which are all thought forms. Right. That, so that's, yes, that in itself would be enough but of course, it is, the deeper implication of that is that you can remove yourself from identification with those thought forms and so, and so you can be the awareness rather than the thought form. Otherwise, <clears throat> if you say, oh, I mustn't judge, you can still be stuck in the mind. Mm. I'm, I must love my neighbor as myself. No, you have to step out of the thought form so that you can be present with your neighbor, give your neighbor, neighbor means anybody, give your neighbor complete and full spacious attention and that's the love arises out of that. So, so it's not uh, traditionally Christians perhaps because they didn't understand the, the original message of Jesus deeply enough they t you tried to be loving on the level of mm. thought forms but you can't. 
You have to right. step out of the thought forms that create the condemnation and the criticism mm -hmm. and be the awareness underneath it. And then you meet the other in that field of awareness. And you, in that field of awareness, you, you are joined with every human. You feel, you feel the oneness because the, the separation is created by believing in every concept, that in every concept is a little, a little barrier. Mm. Judgment, condemnations are big ones. Right. Uh, well, what do you say to, um, I mean, I get this a lot, I'm sure you do as well, to you know, all the bad things that are happening to good people. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the accidents, the, the, the illnesses, the, the economy, I mean, all of the things that people are so filled with, with fear, which to me is creating an awful lot of unnecessary illness in, in our society. Yes, the big mm -hmm. challenges coming, some challenges come on an individual level and sometimes in certain time periods there are large numbers of people who are facing similar challenges in a country or a group of countries and life is not even meant to be free of challenges it's mm. the challenges have a purpose they many of them of course are produced by the egoic consciousness but if you look at it from a highest perspective even the egoic consciousness that produces the suffering and the dysfunction on the planet in collectively and in individual lives even that ultimately has its place in the transition to a higher state of consciousness mm. because eventually the ego creates so much suffering and challenges that it itself destructs it awakens you because you can't stand the suffering anymore mm. <laughs> that happened to me <laughs> So much of the suffering, though, seems to be around this whole thing about greed and um, and money and the economy and you know the the dysfunction that our world seems to be in at this time. That there seems to be almost like yes, that, that, it's a crisis moving towards a crisis point. Right. And I, again, I believe that's connected with the awakening of consciousness because it's only through the when the crisis is reached that a new level can be attained. I think that probably applies to every species, even on lower levels of development. Mm. Uh, for example, I believe that there's some biologists who uh, all say that also, when they say that life started in the sea and at some point it moved onto land, I don't think any fish would voluntarily jump onto land and start crawling, it's just too hard. But, but if a fish lives, if there's a huge area of water that suddenly shrinks over a long, long, long period of time, suddenly the fish is forced to move out onto land. And then at some other point, an animal is forced to develop wings and fly because a crisis has been reached. Mm -hmm. And then a, 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 a leap happens to a different level of consciousness, for in humans it's consciousness, and that's what, where we are now, where the egoic consciousness is becoming more and more dysfunctional, I, or compared to a caterpillar who is approaching the end of its lifespan as a caterpillar, when the crawling gets more and more difficult. Before it was okay, the caterpillar was a caterpillar, but now it's reaching the end of its lifespan and says, oh, I can't move anymore, this is terrible. But yes, because you're destined to come to an end, to metamorphose, what is it, whatever, into the butterfly. And so again, the egoic consciousness creates more and more havoc on the planet. What about individually though? As you're saying that, I'm thinking about myself yeah. and um, what kinds of uh, growth things that have taken place for me and how quickly. I mean, we, I think we can speed up this evolutionary thing, especially within our own selves. I mean, for me, I can, I can, t I can go to very specific moments in my life as I look back at them now from this age that I am now. I can look back to an event that happened in 1974 when I was sent to my father's grave, my father had walked out on us, abandoned us, um, put me in a series of foster homes and orphanages and so on up until I was 10 years of age. Um, 
I grew up with rage inside, anger, just bitterness and so and through a series of just unbelievably mystical, impossible to explain circumstances, I ended up at my father's grave. I didn't even know he was dead um, and was sent there. And in one afternoon, the 27th of August in, 2000, or in 1974, uh, my whole life was transformed. And all I did was stand there on his grave. I had gone there to his grave to do something else on his grave um, <laughs> because I, I was just so filled. And every night I would dream about it. I would be filled with rage and so on. And um, when I got to his grave, uh, something came over me. It was overwhelming. We've just done a film on this called My Greatest Teacher. Hay House is putting it out soon. Um, but it was like... And I was told to go back and to forgive. And I just sat on his grave and I sobbed and sobbed. And I remember saying out loud, and I knew that something very magical, mysterious, mystical that I couldn't put my finger on was happening to me. And I said to this man I had never seen in my life, uh, except for when I was just an infant, uh, from this moment on, I send you love. I send you, for I forgive you, I let go, you know, and. Um, Mark Twain said that, that you know, that the, when, when you forgive someone, you know, the forgiveness, he said, is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And if you can send fragrance out from that rage and from that anger, and I walked away from that experience, I'll never forget it. I went back to New York, I was teaching at a university, I rented a car, I went down to Florida, and I wrote a book called Your Erroneous Zones in 14 days by hand, beginning to end. And today it's got like 55 million copies in 47 languages around the world. And my whole life, when I just practiced forgiveness, this thing with John of God, with this leukemia, when I first got it, I thought, I don't do cancer. You know, that's, I help other people who have cancer. And it's been life transforming. And it happened, it's like it's the process, maybe it's because I'm getting older or whatever, just speed it up. And I went from much more ego to just pure love, just pure love to everyone and everything I encounter. And my children will tell you, the people that are close to me in life will, will tell you that they say, my father has changed. He's just, I mean, he just loves everyone and everything and doesn't know how not to do that. Uh, and that happened, I mean, and I just wonder, what's going to happen this afternoon? I mean, it's like how fast, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, I think we can... If we, if we shifted even Christianity, if we shifted it off of I am the crucifixion and all of the suffering, all of the things that are wrong and all of the pain and all of the images of that to what Jesus really said, which is I am, meaning God, the resurrection, I am the resurrected being, I don't know, I think we can all resurrect ourselves in a huge way. But the crucifixion actually points to the, the because crucifixion, Resurrection arises out of the crucifixion. So right. crucifixion is the, the seemingly dreadful thing that happens to a human being. It was, be, in your case, being abandoned as a child, being mm -hmm. put in foster homes, or the illness now, the seemingly badful thing that actually grace is hiding there. Mm -hmm. The moment you come to, to a place of acceptance, of, as you did with the forgiveness and as you did again with the illness, mm -hmm. then the grace, and that's the resurrection. The crucifixion is the abandonment, the crucifixion is the illness and the, the surrender and then the peace that comes and the connectedness with the source that comes then, that's the grace that is hiding there in every, mm -hmm. every moment when dreadful things seem to happen. Yeah, that's what I wanted you to address. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll see how the audience contributes here. Our first question, I'm curious how you make sense of the power of intention and positive thinking, both of which have been very valuable to me, with the idea of moving beyond the mind altogether. Um, I've just encountered another being in my life. Um, I encourage you to look her up. Her name is Anita Murjani. 
M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I, and you can Google her and see in a few interviews. But <clears throat> she was wheeled into a, uh, a hospital in Hong Kong in 2005 with end-stage uh, lymphoma. She weighed 82 pounds, I think she said, and um, all of her organs had shut down, and her husband and, and family were there, and they were waiting for her last breath. No one who has ever been at that, at that stage of cancer has ever come back and survived. And she um, encountered spirit, God, consciousness, the Tao, um, and was told that um, she had the choice to go back into her body, uh, which she didn't want to do because she was in such a divine, peaceful, she speaks about it so brilliantly. She's written a book. Uh, that'll be out in March also. I wrote the foreword to it. It's called Dying to Be Me. And she came into my life at the right, perfect, divine time. And, and in response to that question, one of the things that she said that she learned in there is that when she came back, one of the things she wanted to do, because within four days, her tumors had shrunk by 70%. She was told if she went back into her body, it would be healed. Uh, and then she saw it healed, because there's no time she was able to see the future and the past all at once. And she said there's no such thing even as past lives. When I asked her about that, she said, how can there be a past life when there's no time? Um, that uh, it's just parallel lives. She said, that's the best I can do with it. It's just everything is parallel. But what she came back with and what she teaches, and she's such a div I just spent, I put her on my public television special, and I really want the world to get her message. She said, the thing that she came back with is that you don't have to be positive. She said, I was positive my whole life. I was, a, a, I was always trying to please people and be as positive as I possibly could. She said, you don't ha it, it isn't about being positive. It isn't about being right. It isn't about winning. It isn't about being better than anybody else. It's just about being yourself and treasuring your magnificence. If you could just look in a mirror and realize who you are, which is not what stares back at you at the mirror, that's got form to it. But who you are is infinite and divine and perfect. And if you could just live from that place, she said, it's, you know, it will, it will transcend all of, the, all of the fears, all of the worries, all of the illness and so on that we have on our planet. You just have to be yourself, who you are. And that's what I spoke about when we came out here, the difference between being ordinary and extraordinary. Extraordinary encompasses ordinary. We're all following the rules in some way or another and filling out the forms. But extraordinary means I treasure my magnificence, who I am every moment that I have. That's the power of intention, which is something I wrote, and the power of now, which is something that you wrote. It's just really about breaking it all down, just treasuring your own perfect magnificence. Yeah. Yes. So being extraordinary really is to be awake, to be an awake being, not moving in the dreamland of complete identification with thinking, but to be aware, to be present. That's the extraordinariness, is the awareness. You are that awareness. And then the thinking that arises out of that is a different kind of thinking. It's, an, it's not the thinking that you need to actually to decide, uh, I'm going to think that kind of thought now, I must try to be positive. You don't, that's no longer necessary. The thinking becomes more empowered that arises from awareness. And in that, the awareness, for example, gives when I give a talk, and you also, of course, all, and any, many of you will experience, have also experienced it uh, to some extent in certain situations. The words come, they're not premeditated, they're not prepared. I don't know as a person what the word, what next, the next word is going to be that comes out of here. So the, word, the words which are verbalized thoughts, 
the thoughts come out of the field of aware presence. And so that's Jesus said that whenever you, you don't need to know what to say beforehand, he says the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say, it moves through you. And so then thought actually becomes more empowered too. And then the, the one, the one consciousness can also create through thoughts that come through you and can create things in this world that you could never even have thought of before. Things have come into my life that I couldn't, if I had been practicing uh, positive thinking at some stage in my life, I did do that also, but I couldn't even have imagined things like that. And so really, to be, to, to, to rest in source, sourceful awareness, and then you will see that the dysfunctional nature of thinking that is there when you do not rest in the stillness of being, then that be removes, it becomes removed and, and the thoughts that do then come are fresh, alive, far fewer thoughts come because all that mental noise goes, the, the burdensome continuous talking in your head, continuous criticizing and judging and complaining, that's still many people's normal state, to have that in that field of awareness that dis if not all at once, it dissolves and then fewer thoughts come but they are fresh, alive, they make a difference in person's lives and so our primary task is, again, what Jesus perhaps, if we're talking about Jesus again, uh, Martha and Mary, Martha is trying to get things busy, get doing things, preparing the meals, come on, help me, do this, do that, walk. And Mary is sitting at, by, uh, listening to Jesus, not just listening, she's into, ah. and Martha says, come help me, we've got things to do, there's so much to do. And Jesus says, don't be concerned, Mary has chosen the, the better part, only the, the one thing that matters, and really he's talking about the foundation, which is to be, being. And then the doing will come, look after itself. You don't become inactive, but that's the point of rest, and that's the Tao again. Mm. The, you do nothing and everything gets done. Right. You don't have a feeling, I am doing it anymore. When you're writing, um, is, it, is, it, is it the same? When you're writing, you write like I do, you write by hand, don't you? I write by hand on a yellow notepad. I use white. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm only number three, so <laughs> I'm taking notes. Will you jot down yellow? <laughs> but this isn't thing. it the same way? What you were just as you were describing that yes. about your what you were speaking about? I was thinking, I just wrote a, a whole book without an outline. I mean, it just, I just sat down every day, four hours or five hours a day. I would just sit and I would just whether it came or didn't come, it didn't make any difference. I was there, and the writing was just. Yes. It's all channeled. I mean, it's all coming yes. from... Yes. It's yeah. to be there, to have this... The space is there. You are there. You are the space for it to come through. And on some days, nothing comes. And then you have right. to be just fine with that. You still you sit there and nothing comes. It's fine. The next day, nothing comes. And suddenly... It's this, an avalanche. Yeah. You know? it's an, and, but you're saying nothing comes. But there, what people will ask me, do you, is that called writer's block? Um, yeah. That's not writer's block. That's just, that's just the joy of being there and realizing that writing isn't what takes place today. If you it's can't, so if, joyful. If you can't accept that nothing comes, then mm. it's writer's yeah. block. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just so peaceful. And so, and that's a new, a new way of writing for yeah. me. And, yeah. and I sent the... As a matter of fact, when I did the John of God, the John of God story, I wrote. I decided to write the entire thing out and put it uh, put it in the book. 
And um, I, I sent it to my editor. Now, she's been editing everything I've written. That's 37 books since 1971. All right. And um, <clears throat> she called me up and she said, uh, who wrote this? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, well, there's like 17 or 18 pages here, and it's not in your handwriting. Um, she, I said, what do you mean it's not in my handwriting? She said, well, the, the slant is different, the shape of the letters is different, the wording is different. You didn't scratch anything out, because I'm writing if something comes, I don't like it, I just scratch it out and write something out. She said, it is, and she said, and I can't edit any of it, it's just... And literally, something had, when I started telling the, the entities that came into my body and did this healing and sent this uh, dis-ease out and replaced it with love, um, also were part of my writing. It was just so, so, so sweet and magical. And I framed one of the pages there because I've never written like that before. I've never had my letters go this way and the shape of them and everything else. It was like something just came in and took over and just allowed it to, uh, to come forth. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what can happen. When, when Eckhart, you're talking about this spiritual sort of inner kind of awakening with the formless and so on, but it gets translated into uh, so many changes that can take place in your life. That, uh, that business about paying attention and being astonished I'm just, I'm just astonished at it all. I mean, I, I did a yoga class before I came over here. I'm just astonished that at 71 I can go into a 105 degree temperature room and do 90 minutes of yoga and walk out and feel great and sit down with Eckhart Tolle and, uh, and talk to thousands of people all over the world. Uh, it, all of it, all of it just blows me away, every bit of it. And all of these faces, all of these nodding, all of this love that's in here. And, and even being with you, it's... Um, it's so wonderful to, to have this closeness together. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it really is. God bless you, man. Yeah. Thank you. So, a question from our online audience. Someone wrote in, since you're both very popular and successful, how do you remain humble and in touch with everyday people and situations and not let your ego take over? It's very tempting this person imagines, to get the best table at a restaurant, the best of everything in the material world, etc. So how do you stay humble? Well, uh, and I'll respond. Well, as Woody Allen said, um, being a celebrity has its advantages. advantages. It gets you a good table in restaurants. <laughs> the The answer really is what I, a little, not long ago, uh, 10 minutes ago, I mentioned um, not to accept internally a conceptual sense of self that perhaps the world is telling you about who you are. So I, I remain humble, but not, I said I drop it like a hot potato. I don't, I don't want to carry around a conceptual identity because I have experienced in my life how much suffering comes into your life when you live from a conceptual identity in your head of who you are, some idea in your head of who you are. I know that that is the beginning of delusion and I'm not having it. So it's an internal decision. It's a, good, it's a dropping it. So. Mm. And, and on, a, on a practical level, I still often go, I still often do my own shopping. I go to the supermarket. It's an ordinary life. Uh, everything, nothing extraordinary in daily existence. Mm. So it's a um, that's just how, that's how it happens, and I know how it happens to, to you, but now you're going to talk about that. <laughs> it, um, you know, you just get more comfortable with being alone. <laughs> and because, you know, in the Course it says, uh, if you knew who walked beside you at all times, 
on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear or doubt again. Um, and when you're just, I guess you just get to a place where you know you're not alone and the things that everyone out there thinks that they would do because they would be rich and famous, like Wayne Dyer or Eckhart Tolle, um, when, when you get to that place, you don't want it. Honestly, you don't want it. I, um, I give away almost everything that I get, and I have children who are very willing to help me with that. <laughs> Eight of them. <laughs> Um, I, um, I own almost nothing. I mean, everything that comes, I, I, I don't want gifts when people send them to me. I, I just donate them. And um, I ask my children to not, please don't send me presents on Christmas and birthdays and all of that. Just think about someone else someplace who, who could use that more and, 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 and give it to them. And I, I don't mean that to say that because I'm so altruistic. I just am not attached any longer to... Um, Honestly, I, I, I tell my kids and people that I love that I don't really feel even attached to this world anymore. I really don't. Um, I see, I get a lot of adulation and adoration and it's wonderful, um, but I don't take any of it seriously. Um, I don't want things. Um, it's just, um, I prefer an evening even when I'm on the road and I'm speaking or whatever and they have a, a, some kind of a gathering for me or a nice restaurant, you, you rarely see me in a nice restaurant or, or any restaurant. Uh, I prefer to be with people I love close to me and, um, or alone with God. And to me, an evening to meditate and uh, to be silent uh, and to read or to just I, I live right on this beach for a good part of the year and um, on Kanapali Beach here on Maui and I, I look right out, I'm so blessed. I'm, I look out at this ocean, I watch the whales, I swim every day in the ocean, I, uh, uh, I talk to the whales, I hear them, um, I swim with turtles out there, these great big sea turtles, I, I have names for them, I know the marks, markings on them. Um, I spend a lot of time in, in, in just peaceful walking and meditating and doing yoga. I mean, this uh, and, and making a difference and and everything that comes into my life, I just pass it along. Uh, and I don't, I don't even want to talk about what I do for others because it's, I don't, it's not about bragging or t talking about how wonderful I am. I do, I do almost all of it uh, anonymously. Um, but it's just, I mean. You've spent a lot of time, I have too, over the years with Oprah Winfrey. I mean, um, she has said it many times that people like us who, uh, I mean, she came out of the Deep South poverty. You came out, you didn't come out of wealth. I mean, you struggled when you were a young man a lot, and were, knew about hunger and so on. Um, as, as, when these things come to, when they come to me, I'm unattached to it. and. Um, and the most ironic thing about it is that the more I am that way and less inclined towards my ego and the stuff and who I am, and um, more stuff just keeps coming. <laughs> it comes in bigger and bigger amounts and it allows me to do more and more and more. Oprah has said the same thing to me. I'm sure she said it to you personally as well. It's, um, you know, I, I get on an airplane and I sit down on a seat and I see a, a short woman with a bag trying to put it up above and I just sit there and thank God for the opportunity to stand up and put it in, in the overhead compartment for her. Now, I don't know if that sounds strange to you, but I feel like, and it happens to me almost every time that I'm on an airplane, <laughs> uh, some little lady who just can't quite reach and I think, oh, this is so great. I get to reach up and I get to put her bag up there and so on. I just think all of the opportunities that come to you to serve um, are the joy that you get out of, out of this place. And, and I also remember that there's, uh, there's no luggage rack on a hearse, all right? That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing to take with us. <laughs> that, uh, that who we are is just that which keeps occupying all of these bodies. Uh, and because they keep changing, they're not real. And that's what Anita discovered, uh, Anita Morjani, 
uh, in her near-death experience, who she is totally cancer-free today, beyond, beyond miracles. They, they sent her case all over the world to all the cancer instances. No one has ever returned from that. And she's back talking about the bliss, the perfect joy, the recognition that higher awareness, which you talk about so beautifully in, uh, uh, in, in your last book on uh, the New Earth, um, she said, higher awareness is when you get to a place, like when you're in your dreams. Thoreau said that you are, you're most enlightened when you are in your dreams awake, when you're a waking dreamer. Because in your dream, for one third of your life, in your dream, all you have to do is put your attention on what it is that you would like to have, and it's there. If you want a new Mercedes in your driveway, you don't have to get up and go down, call the trouble, get dressed, drive the car, test it, find the money to pay for it. You don't have to do that. You just put your attention on that. And if you want your grandmother back, who's been dead for 20 years, she's there. <laughs> Anita's father was there with her, telling her, it is not your time. If you go past here, you can't go back, but you can still go back, and you have something still to do to teach something. So she put her awareness on her father, and while she was in the coma for 30 hours, she saw her brother get on an airplane in India to fly to Hong Kong to be with her for her last breath. She could see him on the airplane. Higher awareness, I think we can do this when we're awake. Highest awareness is anything I place my attention on, I become it, it becomes me. It's not something that's distinct from me. It's not something that's separate from me. All I have to do from a place of God-realized love, and you become it, whatever you're placing your attention on. You do it for one-third of your life, and you can do it in the other two-thirds, I think, as well. That's my reaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. This questioner asks, I have contemplated what the meaning of life is, and I can't find it. There appears to be no real meaning or purpose to it, other than to enjoy it as much as you can. But at the end of it, your life is as insignificant as an ant's life or a blade of grass. And awakening does not happen for everyone, so awakening to self-realization cannot be the meaning either. Could you both please comment? <laughs> that reminds me a little bit of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, which starts, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. How that got into the Bible, I don't know. It's a beautiful piece of literature, <laughs> and it's obviously written by somebody who's very tired of life and has seen it all and can't, re can't find any real meaning in it because He's looking for meaning on the level of mental concepts. And if you look for meaning on the level of mental concepts, all you can find is transitional, temporary things, belief structures, belief systems even, that can be satisfying for a while, but sooner or later your belief system will clash with reality and will lead to suffering. So to look for the, the real, the true meaning of life cannot be found and we, at the beginning of our talk, we mentioned Course in Miracles saying, your understanding is not a powerful contribution to the truth. And we also mentioned the, oh, no, maybe I didn't mention, there's a, a Zen master, a little tiny Zen story to again uh, illustrate this. Uh, the disciple, no, the Zen master asks the disciple, in their usual seemingly fierce way, do you understand Zen? And the disciple says, no, master, I don't. And the master says, neither do I. <laughs> it's not, so the mean, it's not, you can't get Zen through conceptual understanding and you cannot find the meaning of life through conceptual understanding if you are able to relinquish your desire to understand conceptually and access that in you which is beyond concepts, then you find the meaning of life, but you may not be able to say what it is. 
Yeah. <laughs> The question comes from what you said so beautifully, Eckhart, that, uh, that you evaluate, you use your five senses to determine your reality. And the greatest gift you've been given is the gift of your imagination. And in your, in your imagination, there are absolutely no senses necessary. It's why with leukemia, I don't pay attention to what it says on any form or what any numbers show or anything like that. I, um, I know that in my imagination I can place the words I am well, I am perfect health, and, um, and I can determine the validity of that and the veracity of that for myself on the basis of how I feel, just on the basis of how I feel. Because if you, if you look at life the way the question comes at us, what is this meaning of life? Life meaning what happens from the moment of our conception to the moment of our death, but life itself in that, in, 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 in that venue is, uh, is nothing more than a sexually transmitted terminal disease. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's what life is. <laughs> that's how we get here, that's how we end. But uh, I love the poets, and Emily Dickinson was one of my very favorites. And she would, in her t lectures, she would take a handful of dust, and she would say, "This quiet dust was gentlemen, and ladies, and lads, and girls, was laughter, and ability, and sighing, and frocks and curls. This passive place." A summer's nimble mansion where bloom and bees fulfilled their oriental circuit, then ceased like these. This, that's not life. That's just dust. Life is that which keeps occupying, that which continues to turn into dust. And once you get it, and once you know it, and once you make conscious contact with it, you know, Melville said, you know, God's one and only voice is silence. It's why meditation is such an important part of what both of us teach. I've written a whole book about it. So much of, of your book, and The Power of Now, is about quiet. It's about meditation. It's about, you know, understanding that it's, this, it's the silence between the notes that makes the music. You know, it's the space between the bars that holds the tiger. It's like, it's out of... Every word that you're hearing me speak right now comes out of the silence. It comes out of the void. Like, it, here it is, silent. And now it comes out of the void. I remember interviewing the Red Hot Chili Peppers one time for something on uh, VH1, and one of the, uh, um, the drummers, Francioni, I think, John Francioni, something like that. His father was a judge down there, and he was a drug addict. Uh, at one time. He was off of it at that time. And he said, when you're writing music, he said, the most important thing to remember is that all of it comes out of the silence, and the silence is more important than the note. You know, because if it's just all note, there's no music. Like, uh, there's no music in that. It's, you have to have pauses. And it's getting into the gap. You mentioned the gap between your thoughts. Yes. You know, that, that's, that's where life is. And this uh, is an apparently illusion. even the, well, if Deepak were here, he could talk about this. I can't, but <laughs> apparently even the atoms, they flash in and out of existence. Exactly. So there's always the, the, the nothingness and then form, formlessness, form. Mm. The, uh, that's really, w w so to, the balanced life is to, the, to embody the, the two form, the temporary form, to recognize it as temporary, but still even love it as, as a temporary expression of, of the, the, the timeless one. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to despise it as they t some traditions do. You despise the body. Christianity did that. Sometimes even Buddhism occasionally in some traditions do it. But, but to appreciate the beautiful forms, but you can only really appreciate it when when you can sense that which is beyond form, mm. and then you recognize it in the other. There's a beautiful Christian way of saying that is to 
to love the, they say, to love the creator in the creature. So the creator really is, is the one, the one right. formless being. So mm -hmm. what you love in the other is ultimately, in true love, is ultimately always the formless. Right. The spirit. It's just yes. A, and it's, a, and even, I mean, the words of Jesus, again, it's a, he said the flesh counts for nothing. He was talking about his own flesh as well. The flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. And when he said it is only through me that you will come to know the Father, he wasn't speaking about the flesh. He said it counts for nothing. He was speaking about the I am that is in him and all of us. And that is the me he speaks about. Yeah. That's the, you know, the, the answer. I mean, we, we look, we want a nice short answer, so we take an exam. What's the meaning of life? You know, and here's the answer. Uh, if I had to give the short answer, it's just to treasure your magnificence and live as a God-realized being. We have just uh, two more questions. Okay. Uh, this question is directed to Wayne, but I think it would be wonderful for you both to comment on it, which is, Wayne, you talk about slaying the ego and mm. destroying it. Is that possible or is it even necessary? Can the ego be good too? I, I've just gone back and forth on this so much in my life. <laughs> and the problem with me is that I have everything I feel I've written about. So it's, it's all out there. Someone will say, you said this. And, and there was a long period of time when I said the, the ego is not worth defending. Because you know, to me it's an acronym for edging God out. You know? So we, we just push God out of our lives and believe. I always say that when the baby is born, um, after nine months of nothing for anybody to do, it's all taken care of by God or the Tao or spirit or divine mind. And then after nobody does anything, this perfect being comes out and we look at it and say, great work, God, we'll take over from here. <laughs> and in the process of taking over, we teach, like all of us were taught, we, we teach people to be ordinary. You know, who, who was ever raised to believe that they were God? Someone once said that the reason Jesus turned out so well was because his mother really was convinced that he was the son of God. <laughs> when you're a virgin out there having a baby, you, you're really convinced. <laughs> uh, so um, it's, th this ego business is, um, I don't think it's worth defending, but I don't, I don't know how to get out of it. Uh, the only time I'm ever out of it is when I'm in deep meditation and it's only for seconds. I'll go, I'll feel that, it, it's, that it's gone. Um, and, and is it good? Everything is good. I think you're out of it already. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's not, uh, I just feel more love and peaceful. I don't even feel more love. I just feel like I am love. I really feel that that's what I am. That's... That's not the ego talking, is no. it? No, no, it's not. No. no. But every once in a while, I want to go after those people above me on that list. You know, I just... Uh, <laughs> you know. Where did that come from? I... <laughs> Well, that's a good illustration of how quickly it can creep back. It can change, it can. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> and when it does, you have to be compassionate with yourself. Uh, there it is again. When you recognize it, it's not really 100% the ego. When you, re when you know that some kind of behavior is egoically motivate it and you recognize it, yes, it is still egoically motivated behavior, but there is an awareness also there in the background. And that's for, it's a, that's the tr transitional stage from moving from totally being totally dominated by ego to becoming free of ego is to begin to recognize the ego in yourself. Strictly speaking, th the real ego operates in people who have no idea, idea about ego. They are it. So the people who most need, most need to learn about the ego are not here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but and they're they right where they belong. They're right where they belong. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, the real the the, the the real ego is you have no idea that you are totally identified with every reaction, with every thought, with every emotion. You just become it. That's the that's the ego. But when you know there's something in you, when you know there's anger arising, when you know that suddenly there's a stream of negative thinking, so it's, hmm, that is, it's it's still it's an egoic trait, but it's not really the ego anymore because you are there as the witnessing presence, right. the observer, yeah. become the observer. Mm. And then our final question. Should I establish goals for my life? And if so, what kind of goals would each of you place a high value on? Um, I'm not much into goals. <laughs> um, and sitting next to the guy who wrote The Power of Now, <laughs> now and goals. <laughs> seem to be sort of what a bit of conflict. Um, again, I, I wrote some textbooks back in the early 70s talking about the importance of goals. Um, and I can't have them all withdrawn, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, you go, I watch my kids and they some of them are in college now and some of them are out and, and they're worrying about what, what they're gonna major in and trying to set a goal and, uh, um, I just, um, I tell them just uh, to try to just enjoy every single moment and just let yourself be guided. I think it's great, uh, great advice for parenting, you know, it's just uh, guide, then just step aside and recognize that all of us have the anchor of the universe located within us. That's what Lao Tzu said. It's in every single one of us. And let yourself, let yourself be swept with it, let yourself be taken by it, rather than getting your individual ego in there saying, this is what I'm going to do. And You know, it's like Arthur Miller, the great playwright, um, he was asked a question at, a, at an interview with the New York Times. He was 91 years old, and they, and they said to him, are you working on another play? And he said, um, I don't know. <laughs> he said, but I probably am. <laughs> And I understood exactly what he meant. I mean, I just finished writing a book that I put a year of my life into, This Wish is Fulfilled. And last night, I called my, the president of Hay House, my, my best friend, Reed Tracy, and I said, there's an idea germinating inside of me <laughs> that I think will ultimately become a book. I don't know even quite, I just know it, it's, it's starting to excite me. And I, I've often been called the father of motivation all over the world. They've got this title they put next to me, and uh, I always say, I, I, if I have to be the father of anything other than the eight children that I have, I would choose to be the father of inspiration, because I think it's the reverse of motivation. Motivation is when you get a hold of an idea, and you take it where you believe that you can take it with your goals and the, any obstacles that come along, you're going to plow through them, you're going to make this thing happen. and. Um, that's motivation. <clears throat> you get a hold of an idea. Inspiration is an idea gets a hold of you. And it takes you where you were intended to go even before you were ever conceived. I can't imagine you as a little boy in Germany were thinking about, you know, being one of the most famous authors in the world. I mean, and, and, and how it all comes about and, and what's going to come next for you. And uh, like you said, even I don't even know what words are going to come out next. It's uh, being, for me, it's just being completely immersed in the now and, and, and surrendering, just like turning it over. That's just what I do. I turn it over. And the most amazing things happen when you turn it over. That's when God comes into your life. That's, when the, that's what Carl Jung called synchronicity. You have almost like a collaboration with fate. You're letting it all unfold. When the, in the midst of your writing, I don't know if it happens for you, but you know, I, there'll be something I'm not sure or whatever, and all of a sudden I'll go to the mail or somebody will pick up the phone and it'll be right there. And it's like, after a while you start to almost count on it. You start to realize that uh, you, don't, you don't have to do anything. You can just let it come to you. Um, 
Yes. So I don't think you can be totally free of goals. Like, uh, you know, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, so I'm going to have a goal to go to the toilet, you know? I mean, so I, I don't think I can get totally out of that goal place. But um, by and large in my life, I just let it be. I think the Beatles had it right. When you find yourself in times of trouble, <clears throat> Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. There will come an answer, let it be. I don't know, that's my theme. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful song that is, mm. uh, simple and profound. Like you, I don't have any goals except very short-lived, like having to go tomorrow. I have to. Um, my goal is to tomorrow to come here to do this, to do that. I think there is a time in some in people's lives when there is, is a place for goals, but the important thing is the, the nature of the goal, and if it arises out of inspiration, as you call it, or, or vision that comes to you of something that wants to be created through you, it could be a book. When the power of now came to me, I felt this urge suddenly of writing. I bought a yellow notepad. <laughs> <laughs> and began writing the first line. And at that moment, I knew it's a book. And I knew what it was about. And it was very different from the kind of casual writing I had done before over the years, sometimes after sitting with people in uh, having a session, counseling sessions, doing meditation with small groups. I would sometimes say things and then later I would write them down because this was new to me too, but I said things that I didn't know before, they came out. So that was a more casual writing and then suddenly the, an energy stream came of a very different, more em empowered kind of writing. And for, from the very first moment I knew it's a book so in that sense, one could say, I suddenly had the vision of writing a book, one could say, as one could say, I had a goal of producing a book. But it wasn't something that came as, with a promise of delivering some kind of personal fulfillment to me in any way, that I can become famous through that, or I can make money through that, or I can become powerful through that, people are going to listen to me. All these could have been motivations for writing a book, but it was more like something, a realization of something that wants to come into being, and then you help it along, you go with it, you become a channel through which that, that wants to come into being comes into being, it, and it, it may use your mind, it may use your thoughts. Right. So it's, in that sense, one could have a goal, and the important thing is not to be uh, vigilant so that the ego doesn't take over your goal, because the ego, even though you, have, you may have a deep vision, you may not be totally free of ego yet. So at some point, the ego can take over, and a good sign that the ego has taken over is you become stressed while you're doing it or you become, as the Bhagavad Gita beautifully teaches, uh, the, you become attached to the fruit of your action. You're att attached to the outcome. You need the outcome to be in a certain way. And that's the unconscious state, and that's where goal-making really makes you unconscious. So the uh, expression used in the Bhagavad Gita is the, the, it's a spiritual practice to take action, including perhaps having goals, but never be attached to the outcomes. In other words, you enjoy the doing in the now. Mm. The, the now remains more important than where you want to get to. 
if that shifts, if where you want to get to is more important than the now, that's the delusion that arises and you lose yourself in your doing. That's the dreadful thing. So in the enjoyment of the doing and with the enjoyment comes the power also that flows into it. So that the doing isn't a means to an end. Yes, you have a goal, but your attention is in the now and the enjoyment of the energy that flows into the doing. And then it becomes empowered. And then the goal looks after itself. Jesus said the same thing. Don't be concerned about the morrow. The tomorrow will be, look after itself. And the goal will look after itself. And again, it comes back to being rooted in, in that deep place of beingness or awareness so that you don't need the outcome to give you some ultimate sense of fulfillment or who you are, tell you who you are. I want to become a famous author, that's why I'm writing this book. Mm. That's a recipe for dissatisfaction. And I remember saying to people when I was writing the book, and by the way, people said to me, you're writing about the now, think of something else, it's been done so many times. <laughs> it's, it's old, old stuff, the now. <laughs> Ram Dass wrote about it a long time ago and several people said, think of something else, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, it, it, it came the now wanted to be written about, so... And I remember saying to people, I don't really mind how many people buy the book and if nobody wants it, I'm fine with it. I don't know why I said what I, what I said. I said if, I, if nobody wants it, then I'll just, I will make a living selling tomatoes. And I, I really meant it. I wanted to sell, I would sell tomatoes and be just simple living, but I, the book wanted to be written. But I'm not, I'm not going to look to the book for some kind of ultimate fulfillment on a personal level. That's I think that, and I think that's important as we close, that, that when you get to that place, you know, uh, Patanjali said, when you're inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, he said, all of your thoughts break their bonds. He said, your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. And then he said, dormant forces, which is what you were speaking about, things that you thought were dead, dormant forces, faculties and talents come alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. You discover yourself to be God. And these dormant forces just follow after you and take care of it for you. I think the best definition I ever heard of success, I've used it for my whole life. I did a whole PBS show out there in Concord, Massachusetts. I laid down in this man's bed uh, to just get his energy, sat at his desk, um, felt great uh, identification with uh, Henry David Thoreau, you know, who was put into jail for not paying his taxes to, to a government that was doing what they were doing to the Native Americans, a man of real conscience. A great definition, a good way to end this, I think. He said, if you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams and endeavor to live the life which you have imagined, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. It will chase you. That's how it works for me. And it seems that's how it works for you, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.